Welcome back to the Ransom Tart Podcast. We have a treat for you. A couple of months ago, we ran a really brilliant conversation that Sam and Blaine had with Dan Allender on the And Sons podcast about trauma and responding to people who are in trauma. And what do you say? What do I do when I get that phone call? What do I do when I get that text? So hope you heard that. It was a two-part series. And we did that partly to feature Ann Sons podcast. You guys, there's an Ann Sons podcast. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> <laughs> and there it is. There is that answer. You got to go find it. It's not here. It's really, really good. And um, lots of great content. About half of it is more of an interview format, unlike the Ransomed Heart podcast, where they have experts on. They have trendsetters, people who are commenting about culture and millennials and the development of youth and all kinds of things. So we're going to do that again now because, well, because I was on this one. Now, you're the expert. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so I wrote an article for Ann Sons Magazine, Winter Issue. It's an online magazine that we do for young men. And the article is called Five Agreements That Are Killing Millennials. And it got a lot of good feedback, got a lot of interest. Um, it also got <laughs> some hostile comments too. But uh, of course it did because of the culture of the exalted self and the offended self. Anyhow, we then went into the studio with that. And Sam and Blaine and I, had uh, a couple conversations around those assumptions and were able to unpack some of the ideas more. And we thought that you would enjoy listening in on this. Yeah, I mean, so cheers to you for listening to this because you this is a hard one not to judge by its cover to make some assumptions about what we mean by agreements and that are killing millennials. And this is actually a very hopeful conversation mm -hmm. and, and one spoken not from judgment, but from invitation. And there's lots of judgment out there for millennials, and we're not jumping on that bandwagon, but we are naming some things in this episode and the, the part two that are cultural trends that are easy to swallow without thinking of that are having pretty detrimental effects and the hope that is possible when you are not living in them. Yeah, when you break some of those agreements. Part one. When this last issue of the, of the magazine came out, the Five Agreements article was one that we'd been kicking around for a long time, like felt as though there was some data, some advice to be given in this world, but wanted to give it time to shape and hone and knew that as soon as you were going to write about it, we were going to need to talk about it because it's massive. It's massive. And it's really a book, if we're honest, <laughs> seriously, that needs to get written. And because just in kindness, it allows you to provide a lot more content and direction because our hope is is direction and hope and restoration. That's that's the purpose of talking about it. Right. If it was Time Magazine, it would be why millennials are the absolute worst. But because it's not Time Magazine, we're actually after like mercy and help and affirmation for young guys. Totally. Including ourselves. You know, I was curious for my own sake. This is things that are true and can be addressed and can like, if, when you break these agreements and you live outside of them, it's really hopeful. Okay, so for those who didn't see the article, we probably ought to say, what, what I did is I wrote an article called Five Agreements That Are Killing Millennials. I meant to be that dramatic because I think it's that serious. I think they're, it's that consequential. They're potentially like super destructive. And the five agreements are that doubt is one of the highest virtues, that offense is just the worst that social justice at this point really is the best expression of the gospel. Agreement number four is that God had nothing really in mind when he made humanity, when he made us, when he made me to personalize it. And then the fifth and final one is there's really nothing epic about my life, an agreement that goes deep into issues of meaning, although they all go deep into issues of meaning and direction and purpose and intention and so you've essentially just described the world in five statements. Probably the beginning place for our conversation here is what makes an agreement an agreement? What is it? How is it different than, right. I don't know, a claim about the world? Or yeah. Maybe that is what it is. Or what we would call our beliefs or our convictions. I think agreements are, they're more powerful and they're less easily recognized. And so let me give a couple examples. Uh, 
chatting with a young woman the other day who I think we would all say is a lively and bright and creative and intelligent and wonderful gal. And as we were chatting, a lot of I need to change type statements were coming out and a lot of what felt like self-contempt. Me is not good. I, I need to be different and body image and that sort of thing. And and in the body image area, she would fit, you know, the profile of like a magazine model. Hmm. But the way that she was seeing herself was grossly overweight. Hmm. And it was not reasonable. And that's a good, like, boot, 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 you know, heads up to an agreement is that this is deeper than I came to this through reason. Agreements are, are deep convictions that we absorb or are injured into, come to us in times of vulnerability, and they tend to be unexamined. We just kind of swallow it and embrace it and sort of absorb it into your being, and it becomes an orienting belief, but it's deeper than like what you would call your creedal statements or that kind of thing. Is that helping? Like it's... Yeah, it definitely is, And but obviously I've been fairly familiar with the term for uh, over a decade now. So it, for me, one of the ways I look at agreements are on a psychological level, on a spiritual level, they become these filters through which you experience reality. You experience Bingo. yourself, you experience action. I'm never going to get a job would be one. Yep. Uh, there's no one out there for me. Or I lost the one person that really was for me and knew me and now no one else will ever know me like they did. I experience people living and saying and experiencing those all the time. And those be, those are categories for me of when you hold on to it, you do experience reality through that filter and, and actually can change some of your reality. Well, the awful thing is, is that once that's your filter, all of the data, quote unquote, that comes your way just confirms it. Yeah. You know, they didn't invite me to the party. I didn't get CC'd on that email. I was dropped from the text thread. Well, yeah. And is there more than just data, too? Like, genuine action yeah. can be changed because of your agreement? Oh, totally. Right. It, so, that's good to name that, Sam. It's, it's, a, it's a filter by which we begin to perceive the world. Yeah. Yeah, and I think the helpful thing in terms of this conversation is we make agreements sort of across areas. We make agreements about our own identity, I will always be an outsider kind of a thing, or I can never be strong or something like that. My body is always against me. And we make them about God in terms of God will not speak. God he, is not interested yeah, in my distant. suffering. And then we also make massive agreements about the world, about what kind of place we actually occupy, what's the nature of the story. And those ones sort of infiltrate every dimension of our lives because they become the way that we orient ourselves to the story we're living in. And those are some of the ones that you were writing about here are just agreements that shape the world for millennials. Yeah, big time. Exactly. So starting with doubt is one of the highest virtues. And we've had a number of conversations around this, but with kindness and compassion, I don't think your generation has really allowed what it has done to your soul to live in the culture of expose. Like, you were raised on the world of investigative journalism like no generation before you. And all of these trusted institutions and people and corporations and stuff, you know, just one after another. Hey, guess what? They were lying the whole time. Hey, guess what? That's actually totally toxic. That Nalgene that you've been drinking out of, right? Guess what? It's not BPA-free and you're screwed. You know, just one thing after another. Yeah. And I think the thing that I'm so sensitive to there is we were born into that. It exploded during our generation, but there's something about coming into an atmosphere that already has a sort of slant to it. Right. And you have quoted Dorothy Sayers as early as the 1950s talking about we now live in an age that is obsessed with debunking yes. and debunking great statesmen for their personal lives, debunking great movements for their poor motives or leadership. And when you are born into a world that already has 50 years of momentum or 40 years of momentum in a particular direction, it really can look like 
wow, truth has been untrustworthy and people have been untrustworthy for years and years and years now. This looks like an established fact. Yeah, exactly. And what does that do to a person? Right. I think about the ways that may have started and been in full swing in the 50s, but with the way the internet works these days, it's like just the world is made out of glass. It's fragile and it's see-through. Yeah. And I think some of it's totally justified, like some of this culture of debunking where you get really jaded by, here's your politician and they're, you know, advocating for these things that you believe in. And then you find out that they're a child molester. Yeah. And you're like, that is something that you need to know, that it, that, yeah. that matters. However, it seems like that just keeps happening and happening and happening in large and small ways. And in a smaller example, Susie and I bought this mattress thing. I don't know, it's not a, I don't know what it would be. It wasn't a topper, but you're going to use it as a mattress for our daughter's crib. And we try to be particular when we buy things for our child. And so we bought this organic cotton mattress, you know, which I even make fun of, as I say. And when it showed up, it was in the, you know, the packaging and it's got this stitching all over it, 100% organic cotton. And I'm like, okay, great. Well, this is fitting the bill. And then I look at the tag, which has the uh, materials used in it. And right there is labeled 100% polyester. Exactly. How do you not disagree with I can't trust anything in a world like that. Oh, it's just tons and tons of that, right? The chocolate, you know, that you eat is made um, from slave labor and just one hurtful thing after another getting exposed out there. And then I think the ultimate culmination of this is fake news. Oh, yeah, man. Right? Like that's that's sort of the piece de resistance of this phenomenon. We're describing that you can't even trust the news, folks. You can't you can't now trust the expose that you thought, you know, is like what does that do to human conviction? That's the core issue, and that's why I brought up this agreement. What does that do? It feels like the agreement that doubt is one of the highest virtues is built on several foundations. And one of them is this culture of the expose. And the fruit of that is, I can't trust anything. I don't want to trust anything. I'm already pissed and disenchanted. And ready to mistrust. Oh, yeah. Guilty until proven innocent for every person, every product, every company. Yep. I like, And that's partly because I'm a cat person. And when I meet somebody new, I'm like, <laughs> and then you know, I get to know them. I'm like, oh, okay, you're fine. Yeah. Uh, but the like cultural level, the expose, the debunking, that pillar of the the doubt monument, yeah, everything is everything is suspect. What are the others, would you say? I would argue another pillar that I experienced was the academy and intelligentsia and going through college where they were really good at questioning and tearing down things. Yeah. That if you had a conviction about something, well, you were probably just reading history through one lens and you weren't actually seeing it from the other person's point of view and how you're actually doing horrible atrocities. And the like this convictions of faith or even history, like the only thing that was basically safe was mathematics. And barely. Barely, right? The point I think is to teach people to think for themselves and to question. Mm -hmm. But it was like questioning became the tool you left with and behind you was just a bunch of rubble with a few math tools. And I think hearing those two pillars, which I would totally affirm, I can so see the step that's there that's largely invisible, but it's where the agreement comes in because that human beings can be very deceptive, that human beings apart from God have a wicked heart until they get a new heart from Jesus. Like, these are actually sort of facts, like observations about the nature of things. But to go from like, people can be deceptive to no one is trustworthy. You've yes. actually just made yes. a jump. Or to go from many historical political positions and scientific positions have actually had major blind spots. But then to go, knowledge is foundationless. Like, you've actually crossed a little void there and and there's not a stepping stone those don't connect but you just see i am aware of separating those things was so difficult because it all felt like one thing of like no look at the evidence politicians lie don't trust anybody companies lie don't trust any company information is highly inaccurate be careful with knowledge 
But then next thing, I find myself in a total void, so. Yeah, exactly. It is a step without a stone to go from that to doubt is actually a virtue, but it feels intuitively true, right? Just mistrust, mistrust everything. And, and okay, I think there's one more piece to this that's honoring. I think that, it, particularly among Christian millennials, it is an attempt to express humility. It's, I don't want to be arrogant. I certainly don't want to be one of those judgmental, you know, people that I see on TV or, you know, hear their stuff online, and I don't want to be part of that. And so, in humility, I'm just going to take the posture of, I don't know. I don't know. These are just my opinions, but I don't know. And the reason why, this is a super damaging agreement that doubt is actually a virtue, because your capacity to believe is crucial to a healthy life. It's crucial to something like friendship. If you tell me, hey, let's meet tomorrow. There's this killer bakery. You've got to try these pizzas that are coming out of this place. Like, I have to trust that you'll be there. I have to trust that your intentions toward me are good, that this friendship is real and is going good places. Like, Anything you want in this life requires a level of belief. It's so interesting that you give that exact example, Dad, because after you wrote the article, I read an essay by C.S. Lewis called On Obstinacy and Belief. And the point that he was making is, he was like, you know, you see Christians cling to these beliefs about God. This seems to be opposed to sort of the empirical worldview. And he just goes, it's not. And what he explains is, as in relationship with a person, once you have a set of data that confirms your opinion of them, it's not actually considered like a virtuous way of operating to hold their every action in suspicion. That's actually bad faith in a person of going, you show up to the pizza restaurant and I've already ordered a pizza. And I go, oh, so I just didn't think you'd make it. Like I didn't think you were coming. Yeah, I, didn't, I don't really trust that you are going to be where you say. And nobody would say, wow, what a great, humble person holding his beliefs in sort of a loose hand. But it's like, no, that's a bad friend. I think where this becomes, I know you're going to get here, but so damaging is that is also what life with God is like, is because it is relational. It's not, well, every new time God is on trial, but actually once you are convinced that God has a particular nature, like you are the friend waiting at the pizza restaurant trusting that he will show up. And the longer you wait and trust, like the more you actually affirm your belief in the quality of this person. So the ramifications are huge. I mean, let's just point out that Christians are also called believers. I mean, we, what makes us this particular tribe of people is belief. And I think that Jesus is very compassionate towards doubt I think he's understanding towards it. He he makes a in in the beautiful story of doubting Thomas after the resurrection. You know, Thomas wasn't there when Jesus first appears in the upper room and kind of blows everybody away. <laughs> it says they were terrified because they thought he was a ghost. I mean, he's they're freaking out, understandably, right? Thomas isn't there. How kind of Jesus to to go ahead and show up a week later when Thomas is there and say, "Hey, Thomas, look." You know, touch my hands, hear my scars, right? Stop doubting and believe is actually Jesus' posture towards doubt. He's compassionate, and he'll go to lengths to try and help you address it. But doubt is like a millennial membership card. Like, it actually is, it's almost considered cool and hip to be the suspicious person. Yeah, I just don't trust that. I don't trust that. I don't tr like, that'll get you access to a whole lot more parties than being a, you know, hardcore believer will, right? It's the laid-back relativism that is considered, you know, kind of the coolest person in the room. Yeah, I think I see it lived out in a couple of ways. One is that person who's using it as their membership Another is a person who's using it as a shield of like, I don't trust the world anymore. I don't, I don't trust you. I don't, and that 
is a very isolated place. Yes. And it's a very weak shield, but it feels like all they've got left because their shields of belief and of conviction of some solid ground to stand on have been assaulted for so long that doubt is like the last little, I, I think of the guy, the Irish guy in, in the Braveheart film, the guy that has this, the shield the size of like his wrist. <laughs> and he like goes, it's got a wrist watch. I mean, the guy is yeah. clearly confident, but it, that's, that's the size of the shield that doubt feels like. Um, yeah, it feels good. like the last thing you're holding on to. And it's not actually as safe as it feels. Well, let's be honest, gang. Let's be honest. Doubt serves a function. And the function that it serves in our lives is it releases us from action. As long as we stay in doubt, we don't have to act. We don't have to commit. We don't have to risk. And there is a deep inclination, particularly, I think, in men, to, I am not going to act until I am guaranteed success, right? You know, the guy that I met with last week is just going through girlfriend after girlfriend after girlfriend because he is looking for the perfect one where he, this is going to go well. I am not taking chances here. And I just want to point out, like, doubt has a function, gang. Let's be honest about it. And I would just say it's so true that once you move past doubt, you really risk looking like the guy who goes... Yeah, I don't think all religions lead to God. In which case, not only are you uncool, but you are like not with it, condemning, out of date, maybe insane, and that there are massive risks. And I think simply just to reiterate, it's safer to stay in doubt. But as a theologian, I once heard lecture and <laughs> described it as just a form of intellectual cowardice. So... Yeah, so doubt is not a virtue, gang, and it's not it's not up there among the highest of virtues. And I know it feels like it is, and I know it fits you well among your millennial peers, but here's what I want to come down to, the, the erosion of your capacity to trust and to believe is a very damaging thing. It is something to be fought something to be resisted against, some, something to seek assistance with and help through conviction and, and through trustworthy people and in order to come to a place where, where doubt is not your abode. It's not your dwelling place. Right. So, doubt, doubt is a tool. It's not a home. Yeah. That's good, Sam. Yeah. And therefore, my point was in point number one of the article was, man, like, break agreements with this. Like, do not let that subtle, poisonous agreement that doubt is actually the best position to kind of stay in. It's not. It's super damaging. I feel like we need to pause here before we go on to the next one, because we started by explaining what agreements are. But you just use this term, breaking them. And for a lot of our audience, that is going to be like, yep, I've heard you use that before. But for the audience that doesn't know what that means, how do you shed the agreement? Like, how, how do you break it? You renounce it before it feels different, okay? Because you, you can't wait till you feel like, oh, yeah, that's not true. I, I reject that. Agreements are deeply rooted in our being. They're reinforced through experience. They're usually reinforced through disappointment and pain. And certainly here, tons of disappointment in this one, right? Gosh, that person disappointed me. That cause disappointed me. That university disappointed me. My parents disappointed me. Doubt is a virtue, you know, and you may have never put it into those words, but it's down in there now. And what you do is you choose to reject it that's what I mean by breaking the agreement. You choose to say, no longer do you get to be the filter through which I see the world. I'm not living by this. I'm not staying in this. It's not my home anymore. It's a tool I can use to double check a company out or, you know, double check a claim on a car that I use car that I'm trying to buy. You betcha. Of course, right? Be sharp. But I reject from my being, from my operational heart and approach to the world, I reject this 
pernicious thing that that doubt is actually my safe place, that doubt's actually cool, hip, right, warranted, however you would say that. You reject it. Yeah, because the words you would use are probably the ways it's manifesting for you. So if it's, this is my safe place, or this is what I believe, like that those are very different things, but they're going to be what comes naturally to you. Yeah, And, and literally to just pray and announce, I reject the agreements that I've been making with doubt. It's really been ruling my experience, and I reject that. I reject that. Yeah, it's good. So, that's one. (laughs) Number two feels like it proceeds very nicely from number one. They're they're connected, as we'll see all the way through here, but... Proceeds, not begotten. Begotten, not proceed. No. Begotten, not made. Uh, oh, yeah. Proceeding from the who proceeds from the Father and the Son. There you go. There you go. Um, not precedes, proceeds. That's what, proceeds. I don't know. Proceeds, proceeds. The person. This, is, this is how it, people proceed. become heretics, man. It's like <laughs> well, it's a little mumble. <laughs> it just and it proceeds. Enunciate. And then you're just dead. All right. So tee us up. So agreement number two, offense is the worst. Riff on that. Wait, can I jump in first? Please. Okay, because there's this super an- <sighs> it's super annoying uh, the image that's projected of the millennials as being very quick to being offended themselves as being these little snowflakes uh, you can't you know, little butterflies. You just oh my gosh, I'm so offended by what you just said or what you think and like okay, sure, maybe there are instances of it and maybe I'm too close to see if it's true or not however I also think that's something that people are doing to sell magazines I think we can be very touchy as a culture I don't think I would limit that to millennials Mm -hmm. this is not that offense is the worst it's not ugh we're all super offended and we need to get over being so thin skinned this is I do not want to risk offending someone else to offend someone or a people group or a gender, or a political position, or a nationality. These are there little ways we can offend people? (laughs) Um, To offend, to speak or act in ways that offend people or people groups really shows that you are just a despicable person. And therefore, like, doubt is the highest virtue, I think, Millennials have really embraced this thing of, man, whatever else, whatever else, just don't be an offensive person, right? Just don't do anything that would offend. And initially you go, well, yeah, like who who wants to be the jerk in the room? It's all about love. Yep, that sounds right. But what it gets you into is what I described in the article as a game of twister with an octopus. Because in our current cultural moment, on any given day, you have no idea what the offense de jour is, right? What What is the current, like, what actually are we calling that people group now? And what would it, you know, that, that socioeconomic status, ooh, I'm not supposed to say anything. Of, it is contortion. It is paralyzing. It is immobilizing to try and operate from my first premise is just don't do anything that's offensive, right? Don't be that guy, right? Be the sensitive, be the culturally aware, be the in-tune, in-touch person that knows the right jargon and is not bringing offense. I just wanted, though, sort of acknowledge the risks here. Like, where my mind went is it reminds me of a short story by the writer, is it called Asa, for this, like, who is a Native American writer. Look at me, guys. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. I don't know, I don't know uh, Native American is that, first people. I know. I know, but First Nations <laughs> writes a short story about Native American man kills a cow from a cattle ranch to save his dying father, ends up getting hung by the cattle ranchers, and you're like, What? That was insane. But we do have something like if you are the offensive person, you will then be slaughtered. Like you will be hung. The one exception we have for sort of gentle action is anybody who trespasses any boundary at any one time. So I just want to acknowledge there is, like, the real risk of self-preservation playing into this, where a person knows, not only if I offend someone, am I just a bad person, but under be, the surface, there's, you will be crucified. I'm, yeah, yeah, that's big. I'm going to be crucified. And and 
what I wanted to say, just to jump into the heart of this particular agreement, was don't be offensive, don't offend, be be politically, culturally, socially, um, gender sensitive is actually not a strong enough foundation for a life. Now, love is. Love is. Love is a very, very strong foundation from a life. I choose to love. But right away, you, you can see the cultural difference here in that Scripture says, speak the truth in love, right? Mm. You know, let's just take alcoholic friend, uh, for example. Don't offend because this guy's got his struggles, and who are you, and you got your struggles, versus, no, 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 love, take the car keys away. Like, you don't get to drive home tonight. Now, that's offensive. That person will take it offensively. I don't think it is offensive, but they will be offended by that action, but that action is actually love. Mm. And so, what I would say is, like, love is a far more orienting, guiding, reliable, trustworthy, far more powerful and redemptive place to act from than just be hip and sensitive. Mm. Yeah. I mean, the example that comes to me of the fruit of the culture of offense and not being offended is Susie's ethics class in her master's program. This class that was meant to talk about different people groups and different issues that they're going to come across working in a hospital as you have people with tons of different backgrounds and all sorts of privacy issues and all sorts of ethical dilemmas that a medical professional needs to be ready for. Their class was literally brought to a standstill because of how many people were jumping in and snipping at each other. And I mean, it's an extreme example, but... And saying, that offended me, that you even brought that up. Yeah, which is, which is you know, obviously fighting my thin skin thing earlier. But the, the point was, in this case, people were so afraid of phrasing something wrong that they just wouldn't ask a question to begin with. Like, you couldn't actually have conversation because to say the wrong word or the wrong anything, you would. You'd be tarred and feathered. You'd be, you'd be hanged. You'd be run off the island. And I wanted to go like, wait, this is an ethics class that's been brought to verbal standstill. Paralysis. Like, it's crazy. Yeah. And to me, it's... As we're talking about, you know, the the goal being operating out of love, not being offensive, can sound like that. And the, I'm I'm reminded of some of our conversations with um, we had Scott Morin and Mandy Nelson on the podcast a while ago, and they do a bunch of Hebrew studying. And in one of their conversations with us from the Old Testament, they were talking about the difference of of sin in one case being not totally wrong just even off the mark. Like if you were looking in the right direction, trying to do the right thing, but you are a few degrees away from the actual direction, that in and of itself is can be wrong. And in this case, that's what it feels like to me. Like it it can sound right. It it can be like, wow, so I'm going to be a really kind person. Sensitivity can sound so right. Totally. But actually you're vanilla and you could be doing so much more lasting damage as in the case that you use of the hypothetical friend who's the alcoholic, you being super smooth and, you know. Accommodating. Is potentially going to get somebody killed. Exactly. It's interesting. Back in the legendary vitriolic 2016 elections, back when I was still on social media, the election that actually got me off social media, so thank you for that, 2016. I just remember seeing articles on Christians should vote this way, Christians should vote that way, Christians should care about this issue, what's a Christian perspective on this? And I just felt so disoriented. I wanted to go back to where are we actually starting from when we get, you know, 30 paces down the field to how we're deciding how we're going to interact in, like, situation-specific things. And I remember picking up a book by theologian named Nigel Bagar, and it was just behaving in public, like a theology of Christian ethics. And his great point, just nutshelled, is he goes, listen, at every point in history, various dimensions of the Christian faith line up with culture. This is just a fact. And he's like, our call as Christians is not to be distinct or similar. It's to be integrous. That's a loving life with God if we actually 
want to rescue the world or be a part of God's rescue of the world, it requires actually speaking and walking out like the integrous whole of Christianity. And I think that is so helpful around this thing of offense, especially because at various times, like the dimensions of loving your neighbor, of the grace of God, of sort of the father ready to welcome anyone home, like rights of the victims. Exact rights of the victims for Gerard who's? Rene Girard. Rene Girard's argument. But it's like really easy to line up with those parts of a life with God that also line up with your moment. And the problem is, is when you're afraid to offend, you actually lose like the whole, which can bring massive value to a person. Like, right the real parts that change people rather than just sort of acknowledging where everybody is and hoping everything's okay. It's, again, it's ultimately nihilistic because it doesn't think, we're get, I'm getting ahead of myself into the next agreement here, but like, it doesn't think that any one thing could be better for any person. It's already public news that I grew up in an alcoholic home, so I'm not betraying facts or relationships uh, by that. I've written quite a bit about it in order to help other people with their stories and, and to be honest about their stories and how it shaped them. And one of the tenets of an alcoholic home is the cultural agreement to keep that truth from the world. And so you pretend and you do everything you can to protect the system from exposure but that is not love. That is not love. It feels like the only thing to do in the moment. But as you get older and you go from childhood to adulthood and you can look at it a little bit more wisely and courageously, you can see, oh my gosh, why didn't somebody intervene? Why didn't somebody call this what it was? And, and you can just start naming stories. Why didn't they call that abuse? Why didn't they call that abandonment? Right? Why didn't they call that religious abuse? oppression. How come someone didn't name this? And actually naming things is a very strong scriptural act in love for redemption. To call things what they are is a very loving thing to do. And we're just naming something very difficult now is that this is a culture that doesn't like that. <laughs> right. <laughs> doesn't like that very much. But that is what we're calling People, we're calling people away from the be Gumby, calling people to actually act in love and for redemption, which can be very, very disruptive. If anybody has ever attended or experienced counseling, I mean, that's like super disruptive surgery. <laughs> you cut things to make them better and yeah. some, like to remove things. So, yeah, it doesn't mean you get in there and just start cutting healthy mu muscle tissue. Yeah. So, gang, the whole point about this agreement is it's not about I just want to be the most sensitive person in the room because of Jesus, because of his reputation, because of, you know, so many Christians have been jerks and I don't want to—I actually want to be a poster child for Jesus and his reputation. Therefore, I'm going to be the most sensitive person in the room. And we would just say, eh, maybe the better goal is be the most loving person in the room. And love often names things that need to be named. And we are, of course, saddled with the uncomfortable truth called the offense of the cross. Gang, we're gonna pause the conversation right there because there is more to come. And you have been listening to the Ann Sons podcast on the Ransomed Heart podcast. We are borrowing a two-part episode on the agreements that are doing a lot of harm among millennials, but not just among millennials. So hope you'll come back next time for part two.